in order to get to a future that does not approach two degrees centigrade, we have to not burn $20 trillion of oil on the books of the oil companies. That is one hell of a difficult thing to do, but we have to do it. It's easy to sort of point to a lot of different groups and call them the enemy. To me, the enemy is time. The sooner we act and the more that we do, the bolder we are, the better off we're gonna be. If we don't step in now and start to engage our communities around climate change, then we're not going to be able to make the big steps that we need to make in order to turn this thing around. There are many, many creative ways that people can use their voices and speak out about what we understand with confidence, what's uncertain, what likely outcomes are for our climate system, and everything we hold dear if we do nothing about this problem. Now more than ever, having a respected civic discourse on the challenging issues of our time is incredibly important. Fate still lies within our own hands, and Climate One is about saying, no, we have control over our destiny. So here's our moment to speak truthfully about where we are on climate, and in the strangest way, it might be the moment that people are actually ready to listen. Thanks for joining us for this live stream conversation on the geopolitics of energy. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area and would like to acknowledge the Ohlone and Miwok people who inhabited these unceded lands for 10,000 years. We're recording today's conversation for the Climate One radio show and podcast. It drops every Friday. You can subscribe wherever you get your pods. And you can submit your questions today in the comments section of the live stream. I'm delighted to welcome Amy Myers Jaffe to Climate One from the Commonwealth Club. She is Managing Director of the Climate Policy Lab at Tufts University Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Amy, welcome back to Climate One. Thanks Let's for having me. Let's begin with the end of the Soviet Union. Boris Yeltsin stood on the tank in that iconic moment and was elected first president of the Russian Federation. He appointed Vladimir Putin as prime minister, preparing him for leadership. The Berlin Wall was down and Russia continued to use energy as a geopolitical tool. How did that play out from the fall of the wall until, say, 2020? Well, you know, it's it's been a journey, Greg, and it started out somewhat positively after September 11, you know, Vladimir Putin approached the United States and said that Russia could be the secure sea of energy for the West. He came to the United States. We saw American oil companies go and help Russia revive its industry, which had just crumbled um, from mismanagement and lack of capital. And it looked like we were all on track to have Russia sort of, quote unquote, be part of Europe. But then over time, things deteriorated. We saw Russia use energy as a geopolitical weapon first in 2006 against the Ukraine, then in 2009 in a way that affected uh, heating in Germany for two weeks. And we've been sort of on this trajectory of concern for the level of Russian supply in Europe since then. Right. And going into this winter, European energy demand was rising faster than supply coming out of the economic slump. Russian companies cut back methane gas to supplies to Europe around 25 percent as prices surged, not in their fi own financial interest, leaving profits on the table. How did Russia weaponize its energy exports in advance of the invasion of Ukraine? Well, you know, we had we had some momentum that looked less frightening. I mean, it, as we were leading up to the Glasgow summit, you saw OPEC plus, which is sort of OPEC plus Russia and some other countries uh, actually say they were not going to put more oil on the market, even though markets were tightening. And a lot of us interpreted that as a belief that high energy prices, especially in Europe, but, but also elsewhere, would discourage global leaders from tackling climate change in a strong way. But luckily, uh, when we got to Glasgow, uh, you know, the United States, the EU, China, you know, even India to some extent really, you know, sort of stepped up to the plate and talked about uh, raising ambition. 
and and we kind of had not as much momentum as we needed in Glasgow, but certainly we did not see the high energy prices dissuade countries from action. And in fact, good diplomacy on the part of the United States and other countries uh, led to some of the producers in the Middle East, like the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, committing to net zero. So we looked like we were over that hump. And then we started hearing this saber rattling about Ukraine. So July 2021, Vladimir Putin wrote a treatise. And in his treatise, he explained about his revisionist views of the history of the Russian people. And in that treatise, he mentioned that um, Ukraine was part of Russia. And he even blamed Poland for the start of World War II. So we were already kind of like lurching on a pathway of trying to understand what was going through the Kremlin's mind, uh, even as early as last summer. And sounds like, yeah, Russia was on a different path from other countries, oil suppliers who kind of came together in Glasgow, that very important climate summit. You know, Germany was seduced by cheap Russian gas and about uh, a third of its crude oil and half of its coal comes from Russia. So as the strongest economy in Europe, how much leverage does that give Putin over Germany? Well, it gave him a lot of leverage. You know, the thesis over the years on Germany is, well, you know, we're going to have this double-edged sword that means that Russia can't act extreme because they need the revenue from Germany. In Germany, we're showing our willingness to work cooperatively because we're willing to buy a lot of Russian energy and support the economy of Russia. And of course, that entire philosophy has now been entirely discredited in German politics. But the German government, sadly, committed a lot of own goals. They did a lot of things wrong. Not only this high dependence on Russia, which of course the United States has been bugging them about since Ronald Reagan. They, you know, Donald Trump went and said, we'd like to help you finance an LNG receiving turbo liquefied natural gas so you can receive natural gas from the United States back when he was first president. Uh, they had some fanfare and then didn't do it. They have offshore wind, ex excellent resources of offshore wind, but there was political opposition to bringing a high transmission wire from northern Germany down to southern Germany to meet that demand. Germany has its own domestic natural gas resources. People don't realize that. Uh, they decided that they would not drill their own natural gas. They would prefer to have the pollution be in other countries. And then you got the decision to close down nuclear which one can understand, but you would wonder, like, does it make sense to close nuclear ahead of the winter instead of after the winter when you're only talking about a few months? And then finally, the worst mistake, I think, that would, could have been totally predictable is that Germany allowed Gazprom, the Russian state natural gas exporter that does supply its supply, to buy its inventory storage, the physical storage tanks that there are in Germany, some of them are not, were owned by Gazprom. And in the lead up to the winter this year, guess what? Gazprom left those tanks empty. Wow. So, when, so, you know, for the soccer metaphor, which works very well in Europe, I was saying to people, talk about own goals. Really yeah. not in a good place. I mean, I'm going to ask you if you could just push your boom down just a little tad away from your mouth. That'll, yeah, I think that'll help. Um, so lots, lots there to unpack. You know, you talk about uh, liquid national gas exports to Europe. Uh, a lot of people in the U.S. would like to say, hey, well, uh, we can replace Russian gas with U.S. gas. Happy to export that to Europe. Uh, Will that happen? Could the U.S. supply enough methane gas to replace Russian gas in Europe and wean them off this uh, Russian dependence? So we increased those exports to Europe uh, over this past, you know, October, November and into this winter. It's helped a lot. Things would be even worse, believe it or not, without the Russian gas. But to export the gas requires special facilities that take the gas and turn it into a cryogenic 
cryogenically into a liquid. And so we have a limit on how much we can do that. So that raises a question, which is a really very challenging question. Do we add more facilities? Do companies invest? Does it cost billions of dollars? Or will that create sort of path dependent infrastructure that will then become stranded as Europe moves more to renewables and away from natural gas over time? And, and that leaves us sort of in a bind between the immediate emergency and how do we plan out not what we do over the next couple of months, but what do we do in the one, two, and three year time frame, as opposed to the 10 year time frame where Germany has already announced it will shoot for 100% renewables. Right. And, there, and there's be a lot of uh, certainly environmental and local opposition to those big natural gas export terminals that those things don't come on quickly. Uh, you said that we're entering an era of abundant, abundant methane gas because liquefied natural gas can be put on ships. Yet there's a lot of research coming out on fugitive methane, which is a huge problem. Methane is 80 times more damaging to the atmosphere than carbon dioxide in the near term. The carbon math is that we need to reduce methane, not increase it. So where does that leave us? Well, it, it does leave us in a problem. Now, there are some bridges State of California has been sort of proactive in looking at renewable natural gas. So I'm making the methane from biomaterials and waste. Problem with that, of course, is once I put it in a facility, it's methane and I still have to be leakage proof. So, but I can add CCS to it, which makes it a negative emissions, which is something we need to go to for net zero. So you're seeing more conversation in the United States and Europe about going to this more renewable form of natural gas. And you do have more producers here in the United States, uh, Pennsylvania, for example, making sure that their new wells are methane leakage free. And you're seeing more activity and proactive maintenance in the pipeline industry in the United States to reduce emissions. And then you see some states being very proactive, like Colorado, which has tight regulations uh, that doesn't allow for uh, the leakage of methane from production facilities. Right. And CCS being a carbon capture and sequestration. So you announced that you mentioned that Germany's announced going uh, to 100 percent renewable. What uh, looking at Europe broadly, what alternatives do they have, you know, back to nuclear, uh, pump up renewables, accelerate the European Green Deal? How is this changing the energy politics and dynamics in Europe? So Europe had a, had a great plan as it was. You know, we all said not fast enough, but, you know, as your listeners probably understand, we have this path dependency of our existing infrastructure. So it's hard to go from today's infrastructure to the new infrastructure you know, in a year. It, it takes some time to do the building and retiring. So, but, but different countries in Europe have different plans. You know, Italy was, uh, is moving forward to be a hydrogen hub, a green hydrogen hub, taking uh, solar energy also from Southern Europe, but possibly even from North Africa and becoming a trading area for hydrogen, which is a made from renewables can be sort of a, a storage. So in other words, it's hard to store the sun or the wind. It's windy mm -hmm. usually at night, it's sunny mm -hmm. during the day, but hydrogen is sort of a bridge uh, fuel where we can um, produce hydrogen from the renewables when they're available and then use the hydrogen later. So Italy is sort of pioneering that, but in Northwest Europe, tremendous amount of offshore wind that's being produced and, and new projects being fast forwarded. And some of those projects in Denmark and other places, again, trying to connect to hydrogen. So, and then we have this other sort of lesser known opportunity. We, we, we all know about batteries as a storage device for electricity here in California, but there's a mechanism where called virtual power plant, where we add batteries to extensive rooftop solar in everybody's home. So instead of having some industrial batteries out 
in a wind farm like they have in Australia or having um, batteries with solar like we do around Los Angeles, you would have every person or business have sort of a small battery, you know, like a washing machine size battery in their garage or in their building. And then those batteries would aggregate together. So you would give your utility the opportunity to pull some of that stored solar energy into the grid during times of peak demand um, or an unusual burst in need like a heat wave. And, and you can aggregate that across many different buildings and households. Uh, it's a pretty powerful tool and they've used it in Western Australia successfully uh, to reduce brownouts. And it's a sort of untapped opportunity and something that can be installed relatively quickly, you know, putting in a new LNG receiving terminal could take, you know, two years. Putting in a new nuclear plant, again, extensive time, many, many years. But putting in one of these virtual power plant systems, we're talking about weeks or months, depending on the scale at which you were going to do it. So that leads us to this other question as we look at Russia which is, will this Russia disruption make metals hard to come by? And we would need those metals to do batteries um, and solar panels. So, you know, there's, there's sort of this broader issue about supply chains that need to be resolved, but I think it's easier to resolve probably metals than it is to come up with new sources of oil. Right. So we have a range of options there from years to weeks or months, yet, you know, Russian tanks are moving in now, hospitals are being bombed, you know, millions of people on the move. What are the fastest actions that could be taken that have not been taken? We see the U.S. banning Russian oil imports. What other energy cards are there to play here that are on the time scale of the tanks moving toward Kyiv? Well, really, the the main tool we have, and the president has already used it some, but he would be able to work with our allies to continue uh, that path is to use strategic national stocks. So we have our strategic petroleum reserve, the Europeans have strategic reserves, Japan, South Korea have strategic preserves, and actually China has been cooperating and also has been uh, releasing oil from its strategic reserves. India has some strategic reserves. So that's our, our first line defense against a major you know, disruption that would, would damage the global economy. And, and I, I need to make this point because I think for our listeners, it's people feel very conflicted. But we have to remember that social justice is very important. And many of us could go with using less fuel. We could telecommute instead of driving to work. We can limit our shopping and not need our car as much. We can cancel or postpone a holiday. But if you're a person in the United States who needs your car to get to work, otherwise you won't be able to earn a living. And the price of gasoline is, California, I mean, we're getting towards seven dollars a gallon. Right. Um, you know, the president needs to address that. And that's an important issue, an immediate issue. And so we have to be focused on our climate goals and we have to be putting in place a transition. But we also do need to do things like use the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And we might actually need to help oil companies drill for a period of time because we cannot have it that Americans can't use their vehicles. It's interesting that your know, BP and Shell pulled out of joint ventures with Russian giants Gazprom and Rosneft. Shell said it would continue buying Russian oil and contribute the profits to humanitarian efforts in Ukraine. That met a firestorm of backlash. CEO Ben Van Bearden then apologized for that move and now says the company will not buy Russian oil. How are these branded oil companies being affected by this crisis? On the one hand, their brands might be taking a hit, and yet they were probably making pretty good profits with a surge in prices. You know, I, I, I think that gasoline is such a fungible retail product that it's not really about the brand. I, I really do feel that 
I mean, BP walked away from billions of dollars in assets, which for which they're not likely to ever get compensation. I really do think that their chairman, who has already indicated he's trying to go on the path of net zero, mm -hmm. right, is was moved by its position in Europe. And and I think for the American companies, they are going to come around to the fact that this war is not a limited regional war. This war is about democracy in Europe. And it's going to be important for all corporations to support the efforts of Europe and the United States going forward. And I, I think the oil companies are understanding that and they've acted surprisingly fast for them um, when it comes to removing themselves from Russia. And ExxonMobil's decision to leave Russia is already leading to oil wells in the Russian Far East to being shut down. And do, what, what does that mean? Does that mean that they're so they, okay? They can't get out of the ground. Can the Russian oil be sold to other buyers in Asia and Africa? This is a very liquid global market. Uh, the U.S. If the U.S. companies and European companies are not there producing, um, how does that affect Russia? Does that mean they can just sell it somewhere else, get it out themselves? Well, there's some element of that. I mean, we're seeing barrels get reshifted. India bought a bunch of cargoes uh, a few weeks ago in a tender. But there's some limits in the sense that, you know, every oil in the world has its own fingerprint and the Russian oil has some impurities that not every refinery can manage. So China is a really, really big buyer. And the question is going to be, will China step up to the plate and take more Russian oil um, or not? And I think it's a, not a given because China themselves like to have a very diversified supply. They don't want to have to worry about um, supply security, just like we here in the United States and Europe. So it's, I think it's really unclear how it's going to play out. We, I mean, theoretically, the oil market's, you know, very fungible. And, you know, I tell people it's like a swimming pool. You can take a barrel out of the deep end and you pour it in the shallow end and the water level in the whole pool. Um, stays the same, but we're already seeing this sort of cancel culture that applies to Russian non-contracted oil. So a lot of the oil that Russia sells, they would just put a cargo out and people would bid to buy it. And um, what we're seeing is we're already down 1.6 million barrels a day of lost Russian production because those cargos can't be sold. And I think that's volume is probably going to go up over time as more and more countries decide that, or companies decide today, for example, the Italian uh, company, oil company ENI said they're no longer gonna buy any Russian oil. So as, as each company or country makes its own decisions, it could be a bigger and bigger disruption. And then it becomes, what do you do? You know, Are we going to release more strategic stocks? Would we give incentives to U.S. companies to drill more? Would we, would we, I mean, the Biden administration has been flying around the world with its diplomats trying to get different countries um, to provide more oil and that's not going well. You know, there's the controversial question about whether or not we quickly finalize the Iran nuclear deal and put it back in place so that we can get that extra, you know, million barrels a day from Iran. So, I mean, it's a very challenging time uh, for, for uh, the White House to balance its long-term policies with the sort of exigencies of war. And, you know, it's, and it's not going as well as uh, it did say when, you know, James Baker was flying around the world in 1990 looking for oil producers to replace um, oil from Iraq and Kuwait. Right. And you worked for Jim Baker, uh, his institute. And 
in Houston. You know, New York Times reporter Lisa Friedman was in Sarah Week in Houston uh, recently, the annual gathering of energy executives. And she said about U.S. oil companies, quote, the vibe is, you know, you thought you were done with us, but as recent events have shown, we're still quite important, end quote. You know, the title of the piece was Suddenly Oil Companies Are Upbeat Again. So how does this play into the oil companies in the United States? On the one hand, the Biden administration is trying to decarbonize, move away from oil production, and yet now they're in this situation where the energy and national security and political agendas have merged in the U.S. and Europe, and you said maybe we need them to produce more in the U.S.? Well, we do, but, but there's a flip side to that, and the flip side is now that we understand, you know, not just, I mean, Many of us understood the climate emergency, but for those who were not on board with the speed and pace of change we needed from the climate emergency, many of those citizens are now understanding that this high dependence on Russian oil or oil from other countries that uh, might be inimical to Western democracy, that this is a problem. And of course, the big solution to that problem is to move off of fossil fuels and to other sources of energy that are domestically produced like solar and wind. So we know where we wanna go. It's just a question of the speed at which we can do it. And, and like I said, the president has to consider the social justice issues, not only from the climate perspective, but from today's sort of COVID experience where we now understand what it means to be quote unquote an essential worker. We understand the importance of supply chains to our economic well-being, but also our physical well-being. And that just takes a certain amount of oil-based fuel. It, it, that's just the reality of how we live right now. And you know we have to make this distinction, which is very uncomfortable between what our best trajectory is, which is to switch as much to domestic clean energy as fast as possible and get electric cars on the road as fast as possible. And the fact that we have 350 million liquid fuel fossil based cars and, on and the road today. And there's quite a debate often about whether high gas prices are good or bad for that transition, right? High gas prices means that, you know, the electric cars are a lot more economical. As Bill, McQu as Bill McKibben tweeted last week, that the sun appears to be providing energy at the same price as last week. Let me say that again. You know, as Bill, McQuin as Bill McKibben tweeted recently, the sun appears to be providing energy at the same price as last week. So... EVs are now more price competitive compared to that $7 gas. On the other hand, when gas prices are high, voters are cranky, midterms are coming, and politicians are very wary and want to get that price down and, and makes them very, you know, um, perhaps less, uh, more reluctant to make changes in how we run our economy. So how does so, the high gas plus play out? So, so listen, I think we're in a totally different situation. What you're describing, Greg, has been sort of the debate over the last 20 years. But I think the way we need to think about this is totally different. We're in a war. We can feel like that war is far away and doesn't involve us. Mm. But because we're, it, we're participating through financial sanctions in supporting our allies in Europe, that means that we are involved in this disruption in in. We are involved in the transaction of trying to stop the further military activities of Russia. And that involvement means we need to reduce how much oil is used in the world. And we need to come up with replacement supplies for the oil we cannot reduce in the short term. And, and those things are not inconsistent we, we should move forward and accelerate anything we can do to get electric cars on the road, if that means the Congress needs to pass additional 
if that means the Congress needs to pass additional legislation beyond the infrastructure bill, they should be doing that. State of California, other states could take state action. And but certainly, we, cer certainly during World War II, people rallied around the rationing of gas, people bonded, felt patriotic, that common sense of purpose. And I think that you're right, our, we're, we're horrified by what we're seeing, these bombings in Ukraine. Not sure it's, it's felt come it's, yet to that, yeah, that it, level. It, of, it hasn't sunk into people yeah. that you can make a donation to the Red Cross, but you could also get out of your car. And that would also contribute to helping Ukrainians and the whole process. I mean, why are you waiting for BP to take action for you when you can take action yourself by thinking about your own movements and your own use of oil when indeed you should be doing that anyway because of climate change? So I, I think that people have not wrapped their head around it. It's such an unpopular thing to say in the United States because we all remember, or some of us are old enough to remember Jimmy Carter in his little sweater <laughs> asking Americans to conserve. <laughs> and no politician in America wants to say that. But I'm a university professor, so I can say it. I mean, when you think about the climate emergency and you think about wanting to support democracy in Europe, the action is the same. You need to use less fuel. You need to not use oil when you can. You need to think about ways to reduce your carbon footprint, which are also ways that are going to reduce the amount of money going to Russia. All of those things are the same. And we're not, we're waiting for someone to do it outside. And we can do it ourselves. Yeah, rarely do we have that kind of, yeah, be the change, yeah, personal connection. Yeah, I think there's a lot of impulse toward writing that check to the United Cross or something like that. And seeing really this, because the power of this, his power is so much about the fossil fuels that-, that uh, Listen, Vladimir Putin is counting on the fact that people will refuse to get out of their cars and people will refuse to put their thermostat down one degree. He is counting on that for the money to fund his war machine. And if we can't take that on board, then he's gonna be right. And that's gonna be a tragedy. And it's a tragedy for the climate. So all bad. Reminds me of that Osama loves your, your eight years. Reminds me of that Osama loves your SUV um, bumper sticker a while back. Also banking on our addiction to oil continuing, right? Um, U.S. oil production declined from 1990 to 2010 and has more than doubled in the last decade. Is the country in a stronger, more independent position now than it would have been a decade ago? Does this prove that energy independence is a valid national strategy? It does, and it doesn't feel like that. I know it doesn't feel like that, but the way you have to think about it is multiple ways. Number one, when oil prices go up, maybe in California, it's not a popular statement, but at least it's people in Pennsylvania and New Mexico and Texas who are putting that revenue into the US economy and creating US jobs and wealth and not people in countries far away. So we're not, expo we're not having a terrible problem with our trade account balances because we're a major exporter of oil we're a major exporter of natural gas. And so our economy is much more shielded from the effects of price shocks than it was back in 1990. This is an important change. And it's part of the reason why even with inflation, you don't see people on television night after night talking about the recession that's coming because we're, we're in a better situation than Europe in the sense that we have a lot of the energy we use is made here in the United States. And we have revenue from the refined products and the crude oil and the natural gas that we export um, from this country. So that's number one. Number two, because of the important policies like for climate for the state of California and other states around the United States, we have many states that have 100% renewable targets. That means that our economy 
is less oil intensive. And what do I mean by oil intensive? That's sort of an economist term. So two minute economics lesson here. Uh, how much oil do we use to generate a unit of gross domestic product, right? So we are now 90, it takes 92% less oil to make a unit of GDP than it did in 1972. This is a good thing. It's a good thing for our economy being needing less oil to operate. And it's a good thing for the climate. And it's a trajectory we're moving forward with to continue to lower our oil intensity. This is an important thing to think about. And one of the big achievements is that we no longer use oil to generate electricity in the United States. So that's really helpful. And as we move to using less natural gas to generate electricity in the United States, all the better. So we really are in a better situation than 1990. And uh, in that regard, as, as an economic impact, but the difference is in 1990, there was a glut of oil on the market. And so when we lost 5 million barrels a day of Iraqi and Kuwaiti crude because of the war, we could make that up easily. We didn't even have to release. We did a little bit, but we didn't really, really need the Strategic Petroleum Reserve because Saudi Arabia had a lot of oil to sell and, and United Arab Emirates had a lot of oil to sell. And they, the Nigerians, there were just countries that had more oil to sell and they could just replace those barrels. But today we're very maxed out and there's very little oil that's sort of sitting around in an oil field ready to go. The Canadians kindly announced that they think there's 400,000 barrels a day of crude oil that they could add to uh, the US. Um, we don't really need it, but we do in the following way. If the Canadians send more oil to the United States and they say they have pipeline and rail capacity to do that, then that 400,000 barrels a day could be exported by the United States back to Europe, right? Either in the form of refined products because we refine more, or we could literally shift some crude oil out exports terminals um, down in Texas and Louisiana. So every barrel counts today. Uh, it's gonna be very hard to replace the Russian oil and gas. A um, lot of diplomacy going on about how to do that. And you know, it's just going to remain a challenge and Americans are going to have to consider high energy prices and the option of conservation as their contribution to what Ukraine is doing uh, to fight for its right to be a democratic country. Amy Myers Jaffe is managing director of the Climate Policy Lab at Tufts University, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Amy, we haven't talked much about Saudi Arabia yet, and there are open discussions, as you said, in Washington about the value of the United States relations with Saudi Arabia. We also seem to be cozying up to Venezuela. You mentioned earlier, you know, that is poss is it possible, as you've said, that because the global economy is moving away from oil, that, that Saudi Arabia, perhaps these other petro states become less important. How is the leverage of energy producing countries changing in geopolitics? Well, you know, I, I've written a book recently, it's called Energy Digital Future, and I have a chapter on this question. And one of the things I speculate in the chapter, which I was hoping wouldn't come true, but it looks pretty damning, is as countries like Russia and Saudi Arabia and Iran, these countries are used to being powerful because of the influence their oil has in the global world. And, and to the extent that we're able to move away from that oil and go to other, other kinds of technologies, those countries are not going to easily give up their geopolitical stature. And one of the concerns I had over the last couple of years was this tendency of those countries to turn to what we call an in international relations hard power. So am I turning to military force? Am I turning to cyber attack? 
am I turning to um, uh, using my financial resources in certain ways, uh, information campaigns, for example. And so we need to address that challenge. And I, I do think when the Biden administration was ramping up its diplomacy for Glasgow, it did reach out to countries like Russia and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates to try to talk about how the global system could create a softer landing for countries that are currently dependent on oil and gas revenue. And it looked like we were making some progress in that regard. Um, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia has a very good plan for greening its industry. They are, uh, have plans to be a major exporter of uh, hydrogen, which is, you know, in the form of ammonia and other things, has some environmental impact, but they were working to try to green that up. So, and they obviously were, you know, investing in solar energy and, and, and other kinds of technologies, including carbon sequestration and storage, which might turn out to be a useful technology for a country like Saudi Arabia. So we were kind of on the right trajectory, but this whole question about, do you need me, don't you need me? Um, you know, we frame it that way. It creates unnecessarily unnecessary acrimony. If I tell you I don't need you, um, mm, does that mean yeah. I only liked you for your oil? I didn't, <laughs> I didn't care what happened to the 25 million people who live in your country. I mean, it's, it's almost a degrading, snaggy question if you are actually sitting in that other country. So I really think we need to reframe the debate, which is how do we, especially the climate proactive countries of the industrialized North. How do we engage countries of the South to promote their ambition for climate action in a way that is inclusive and, and non-confrontational and for the betterment of the planet? Because we need countries like Saudi Arabia to pivot with us as opposed to, hey, they're going to be the losers. So ha ha ha, right? We, we really need to be thinking about, you know, these big countries, Saudi Arabia. I mean, in another time, maybe we could have thought that way about Russia. Uh, but, you know, we saw this historic deal at Glasgow where the uh, many economies, the US, UK, so forth, uh, offered $8 billion in assistance to South Africa to try to green its electricity sector away from coal. We need to be thinking creatively about those kinds of structures for many countries around the world. And, and we need to be helping or participating or encouraging um, countries that are highly dependent on oil for their government revenues uh, to pivot with us. Right, have a win-win strategy rather than a situation where people have a lot to lose, that could be an incentive for, for uh, bad behavior. So, so as they go down, they're gonna go down fighting and, and belligerently. You know, there is a notion that this transition to renewable energy will get away from the power of, of petro states and avert wars for oil and reduce the power, uh, reshift the power. Yet there's also, you referenced a little bit earlier, there is a supply chain for renewables. There's a lot of lithium in Ukraine. There are certain metals that are needed, cobalt and others that are needed for electrification to move away from liquid transportation fuels, move from oil to electricity. So how is that supply chain? And will it be as, as um, harmonious as some of the people claim it to be? Could we trade one vulnerability uh, for another? Well, let me just say the following thing. Oil is what I call a flow resource. The second you need, you use it, you need more. So if I buy an electric car and it has a lithium battery, you know, I don't need more lithium until I'm not using that car anymore, which in the United States could be 10 years, could be 14 years. So, so the trajectory for the leverage is different. I mean, for gearing up, of course, we need a lot of material, but 
um, once I have, that, once yeah, I we, have it in place, once I put in battery storage in Los Angeles, it's not like I have to, I mean, I bet those batteries will be in place for several years until I need to upgrade them and replace them. So, so the question really becomes, you know, how do we manage that? And you see some very interesting, you know, I love California because you have great minds here. And already the former CTO of Tesla, J.B. Straubel, has created a company that is taking, you know, electronic waste and recycling the metals from that waste. He claims that we could supply the supply chain for cobalt for the United States from recycling. Even some of the giant commodity traders like Glencore, big business, they're already moving into recycling. Um, and so, you know, I was, I was on a panel in Europe, you know, virtually, and um, I was talking about the potential of recycling and these, you know, men from the industry were like correcting me, like I'm just this dumb university professor who is out of touch with the real business world. Um, and then later I was showing somebody uh, the video and they were like, no, you were totally right. And, you know, here are the statistics. I mean, it has a lot of potential. Um, and, and, you know, there's no recycling oil. Once you put gasoline in your tank, you can't recycle that gasoline. So from my perspective, it's a totally different issue. And then also we have, you know, chemists and others at work in, in companies and in our national labs, Tesla, you know, coming up with a cobaltless battery or coming up with a new material that's not lithium for batteries. Um, so, I mean, we're going to get there. And if some producer of a particular metal thinks they're going to, you know, gain uh, political or geopolitical leverage over a supply chain or they're going to cause a war over this metal, um, I think that's not going to stand over. I mean, it'll slow us down a little bit on the transition, but there are going to be other technological solutions and other kinds of metals uh, that can be substituted out. So I don't think it's a long-term problem. I, I think that in the end, renewable energy will be easier to promote and uh, move us away from geopolitical conflict. And the other thing I would mention is, which we're seeing in Europe, so if you're going to blackmail me about my renewable energy, you know, for a week or a month or a year, I'll turn back on my traditional facility until I can get through that problem and come up with a different supply chain. So it, it's a lesson about how to manage the transition of infrastructure. Maybe we should not be dismantling everything. You know, now Europe is talking about maybe not turning off uh, the nuclear plants at the same pace that was planned, and maybe um, the way we mothball them have to be different than what we might otherwise have done, um, because we're going to need to uh, make sure that in the transition, we're not constantly being interrupted by some slight supply chain hitch. And one way to enhance that supply chain is to have more domestic supply, at least speaking from a U.S. centric perspective. Um, and there are efforts to increase lithium production in the United States. However, that often comes in conflict with indigenous lands. There's some real controversial mines in Nevada and elsewhere. You know, how do we make sure that in this rush to uh, secure domestic energy sources that we don't perpetuate the environmental racism and injustice that's been part of our legacy of energy in this country? Well, I mean, that really, and, and we're studying that at the Fletcher School of Climate Policy Lab, which is to look at how public funding of demonstration projects, energy demonstration projects, research and development projects, um, and you know, tax credits or other kinds of incentives we give for um, strategic industries. How do we make sure that we do that in a way that's inclusive and um, takes into account environmental justice. Those standards were not, you know, in 2009, when the Obama administration injected a tremendous amount of money into the economy in the clean tech space, uh, those considerations honestly were not taken into account. So let's hope that this time around, uh, we have some strong leadership uh, that will make sure that it's done better. And, and we can think about as we are at 
Tufts, uh, what would be the policy framework to how to do that? Um, and, and how to engage with communities to make sure that what we do is both just and environmentally sound. We're talking about the geopolitics of the energy situation in Ukraine and around the world with Amy Myers Jaffe from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. Uh, we have a question from the live stream uh, here. One listener asks, isn't Halliburton and Baker Hughes involvement in Russia much more important than BP Shell? They are the ones providing the know-how to pull the oil out of the ground. It is, and they've also left. So uh, no question, uh, the US service companies played a giant role. They are not staying. I mean, they learned their lesson. They stayed for a while in Venezuela and they wound up having billions of dollars in arrears that never got paid. Um, and so I think that, you know, it was an easier decision for the bigger oil companies that are the brand names like the BPs and the Shells and the Exxon Mobiles because without the service companies, it's pretty hard to operate. And the service companies were also uh, on, you know, out the exit door. So uh, no question, you're not gonna see American service companies assisting Russian oil and gas companies. I mean, that we're, we're out. And, um, and so really the question is really one of how do we manage the fallout in, in making choices about how much we can do with new energy and how much we have to do by uh, relying at least temporarily on traditional energy. Also, as we get here toward the end and sort of round out this geopolitical picture, you know, China and India abstained from the UN Security Council vote condemning Russia for invading Ukraine. How do they fit into the shifting geopolitics of energy now? We've touched on them a little bit, but how do they huge fossil fuel uh, consumers, how do they fit into the shifting mix? Well, it's a pretty interesting question. So uh, China has a pipeline uh, that goes from Russia to China to give it oil from Russia, and those shipments are continuing unchanged. And uh, the question, and they get some oil via Kazakhstan, uh, so, of Russian oil. So the question really becomes, you know, what will China do and what's in China's interest? And we did see during the Olympics, you know, the Chinese put out this grand, you know, multi-page statement of all the Russian grievances against the West. Uh, and then they listed their own grievances uh, against the United States and the West in this document with, to a lot of fanfare. And I think, you know, as an analyst, my question is, well, that locked them in because there are a lot of things that are happening today that are not in China's interest. It's not in China's interest to see the oil price go up. They import upwards of 10, 12 million barrels a day of oil from the Middle East and from Russia. So that's a problem for them. Um, they, uh, they are a food insecure nation. So I don't think they're a country that can afford to have some kind of a chemical weapon or nuclear fallout in the Ukraine, contaminate the food supply in Russia and the Ukraine and other countries' borders, because that would have a huge ripple effect on an already shaky food system in China that was disrupted by COVID. So there are just a lot of, you know, the, the a lot of the ingredient of just to go down into the weeds, you know, we use phosphate to make fertilizer, which is a big part of how we do industrial food uh, globally. And that's came out of Ukraine. So the question is, you know, does that affect China if the Ukraine's uh, 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 fertilizer input is not available? So it might have been really easy for uh, Xi Jinping of China to envision a three minute campaign where Russia just kind of went in and Kiev fell and they put in a puppet and now everything's great because now the Russians control all these resources in the Ukraine and that's good for China. Like maybe that was a way to think about it, but that's not what's happened. Mm. And you can just imagine the fallout 
from continued war for China. It's going to be very negative. And so it's really hard to predict, I think, exactly how markets, global commodity markets are going to go ha happen going forward, whether China is going to scoop up all this discounted or India scoop up all this discounted um, Russian oil. You know, the, the discount on a Russian cargo in the Far East today is minus $25. So if the price of oil is $100, say, or $110, you can subtract $25 from that if you're China and buy a cargo. Is that going to encourage them? I don't know. Because in the end, if you're China, you don't want to shift your whole refining system to Russian oil and then the Russian economy collapses or something else goes wrong. And now you're scrambling around after everybody else has already found a new way to get oil and gas or has already shifted to other kinds of energy. So the Chinese, I think really, regardless of how they think about it intellectually or geopolitically, they're really in a worse situation than we are because we do have our own energy production uh, more than the Chinese do. And same with India. We have moved faster to renewable energy or as fast and we have our own oil and gas supplies. And so, and we have a giant agricultural sector. So China really needs to think seriously about how to increase its voice to bring a ceasefire in the Ukraine. And it needs to really step up to that plate. And we don't have to say that they need to do that as a favor to the United States or because they're a lover of democracy. They need to do that for their own strategic interests. So much to discuss here. I wasn't there aware of the phosphate connection with global food production and Ukraine. Uh, Amy Myers Jaffe, thanks for coming on Climate One. And if you ever needed more <laughs> reason to electrify your mobility, to go electric, to displace oil, thinking about those children in hospitals and refugees in Ukraine, uh, get into that electric situation. Thank you, Amy Myers Jaffe, is managing director of the Climate Policy Lab at Tufts University School at uh, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. I'd like to thank uh, our Climate One team for making this happen. Ariana, Brad, Austin, Spencer, Steve, and Tyler. We've been discussing the geopolitics of energy with Amy Myers Jaffe. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be hard and depressing, and it can also be exciting. You can hear more on our podcast on Apple or wherever you get your pods. Thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next time, everybody. Bye.